the golden age of air travel. Look at the famed airliners built by the Douglas Aircraft Company. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. We have a special series uh, examining the famed DC family of airliners. Uh, we're going to have a three-part series. Part one is the DC-1 to the uh, aircraft used in World War II. Part two will deal with the post-war years, the DC-4 to the DC-7. And part three will be the jet age, the DC-8 uh, to the DC-10 and the MD-80 series and MD-11. But let's begin with the Douglas Aircraft Company in 1921, uh, the beginning of the operation. What you see here is the first airplane, the Douglas Cloudster under construction in a warehouse in Los Angeles. The gentleman at upper right leaning out of the cockpit is Donald Wills Douglas. The Cloudster ironically uh, was a passenger airplane because that's what the company became best known for. And what you see here is the uh, Los Angeles San Diego airline operated by Claude Ryan. Uh, and it flew 10 passengers between those two cities in the early 1920s. But it was the very beginning. As the Douglas airplanes evolved, uh, the Douglas World Cruisers uh, came to be. Uh, these were uh, an evolution of the DT-1 uh, and 2 torpedo bombers. But the World Cruisers put the name Douglas on the map. Uh, what you see here in a painting by George Akimoto is the beginning of the round the world trip uh, in uh, March of 1924. Uh, the airplanes left uh, as land planes from Santa Monica and were converted into seaplanes in Seattle uh, and made the trip in six months. Five airplanes were involved. One was lost in weather. One was lost in an ocean accident. No lives were lost in the trip. 62 stops. And six months later, the airplanes returned. And the significance of these three airplanes is this became the crux of the logo of the Douglas Company, as well as their slogan, first around the world. And this really uh, brought Douglas into focus as a prime manufacturer of uh, some of the best airplanes in the world. Oddly enough, those three airplanes stayed with the logo into the war years. Here we see the 1940s iteration of the Douglas logo. The 1950s, the beginning of the space age, uh, the globe had now changed into an outline of the earth. And you see the jet uh, style uh, three airplanes, again, symbolic of the world cruisers. Uh, by the 1960s, you had the uh, a missile orbiting the Earth now and a supersonic transport representing the airplanes. And lo and behold, this uh, logo uh, is still seen today, uh, adapted by the Boeing company, uh, which acquired uh, McDonnell Douglas in 1997. But let's uh, go back to Santa Monica, where the uh, piston-powered aircraft, uh, all the piston-powered airliners were produced uh, by Douglas. Uh, Santa Monica is located uh, uh, next to the ocean, about 20 miles west of uh, downtown Los Angeles. And uh, what you see here is the airport uh, in the 1950s. But uh, again, the genius of Donald Douglas and the aircraft that he created, uh, the airliners really became synonymous with the name. Here's Mr. Douglas with his prized 1937 Buick in front of Hangar 1 in Santa Monica, where you see a United uh, DST uh, sleeper transport version of the DC-3. The DC-3 was probably one of, if not the most significant airliners ever built. It changed the world. It really put modern air travel uh, into, uh, brought it into reality. Uh, safe, reliable uh, transportation, uh, coast to coast, really around the world, and uh, was a, just a pioneering, groundbreaking airplane in every sense of the word. By the 1950s, Santa Monica was the center of the universe for airliner production. More than two thirds of all the world's airliners were being built uh, at this facility that you see here. But let's go back to the beginning. Uh, in the late 1920s, you had the Ford Trimotor, the famed Tin Goose, as it was called. And this uh, brought coast to coast air travel uh, into reality. It was uh, uh, the daytime uh, leg of the uh, trip was flown with the tri-motor and at night you were in a train as a passenger connecting to the next airport the next morning. The trip took the better part of three days, which was still a um, little more than half the time of uh, train travel across the country. So it was the, in a sense, the concord of its, of its era. But it was slow and uh, kind of tedious to fly in them. The uh, tri-motor uh, Fokker that you see here, uh, deplaning passengers at Floyd Bennett Field, 
uh, it was an arduous experience to, to be flying in an airliner. Uh, they, they, it was, they were loud and noisy and a lot of vibration, and it just wasn't uh, what you describe as a luxurious experience in those days. The uh, Curtis Condor was another uh, type. And the uh, Fokker airliners were quite prominent in the uh, early 1930s. Here you see the F-32 in Western Airlines markings. And this was the first four engine airliner flown in the United States. Uh, they were basically good airplanes, but the uh, fuselages were tube and fabric and the wings were wood. And this created an interesting problem. Uh, on uh, March 30th, 1931, famed um, Notre Dame football coach, Newt Rockney was killed in the crash of a Fokker trimotor where the uh, wood wing had literally separated from the airplane. Uh, causing the accident. And this created such a uh, public uproar uh, in uh, the quest for air safety that a whole new generation of airplanes resulted from this. The Boeing 247, the first uh, twin engine, all metal, low wing, modern airliner, uh, carried 10 passengers, was fast, reliable, uh, but the uh, production line was uh, completely committed to United Airlines. Uh, and so uh, TWA president, and that's transcontinental and Western at that time, TWA president Jack Fry uh, put out a request to five different manufacturers for an airplane that would carry two more passengers and be even larger and faster than the 247. The winning design, the Douglas DC-1. Wing was designed by Jack Northrop and the DC-1 carried 12 passengers. It was a one of a kind prototype airplane uh, but this was the beginning of the, the game-changing uh, uh, design philosophy from the Douglas Aircraft Company. As I said, only one was built. First flew in July of 1933. It carried uh, 12 passengers and two pilots. Uh, it had a max takeoff weight of about 17,500 pounds. It was powered by 690 horsepower Wright radial engines and later 700 horsepower Pratt & Whitney Hornets. Maximum speed was 200 miles an hour. The range, uh, theoretically, with carrying passengers was 1,000 miles, but it was never uh, put into airline operation. It was a, a proof of concept aircraft. The airplane that did see production was the DC-2. This was, uh, they added two more seats by lengthening the fuselage. And this uh, airplane first flew in May of 1934. Uh, nearly 200 were built. Uh, it carried uh, 14 passengers, it was flown by two pilots and had one purser in the cabin. It weighed 18,000 pounds at takeoff, it was powered by two 710 horsepower Wright Cyclone engines. It had a maximum speed of 175 miles an hour, a range of 800 miles and a service ceiling of 10,000 feet. In 1935, the Collier Trophy was presented to Don Douglas by President Roosevelt for a significant achievement in aviation. And the DC-2 that you see here uh, was actually a, a restored uh, original airplane, uh, which is now part of the museum collection uh, at uh, Boeing Field, the uh, Museum of Flight. The next step was to widen the fuselage and that increased the passenger capacity from 14 to 21. Uh, and that became the DC-3. First flown on the anniversary date of the Wright Brothers flight, December 17th, but in 1935, uh, the DC-3 uh, really was the, the first of the famed family of uh, Douglas airliners that uh, put air transportation on the map. 900 DC-3s were built uh, in the passenger version. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, it had a crew of two pilots and one air hostess. And in those days, uh, the air hostess also had to be a registered nurse to uh, take care of uh, passengers who were experiencing discomfort in flight. Uh, it carried, as I said, uh, 21, actually 25 passengers, depending on the airline configuration, weighed 25,000 pounds at takeoff, initially powered by 860 horsepower Wright Cyclone radials, later the uh, upgraded 1200 horsepower Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp, maximum speed 180 miles an hour, thousand mile range and a service ceiling of 10,000 feet. The initial versions were called DSTs, which stood for Douglas Sleeper Transport. And here you see United Airlines, American was also uh, uh, an operator of DSTs. 
And uh, now the uh, airplanes could fly in uh, mild weather and uh, at night. And this uh, reduced the cross country trip to a uh, little less than a day and a half. Here you see a staged photo of an American DST. You can tell the DST models by the, uh, the rectangular windows uh, above the regular windows. Those are the sleeper berths. And uh, this is a publicity photo shot at uh, uh, Glendale Air Terminal with a Wells Fargo wagon showing the progress in transportation uh, from the 1800s to the 1900s. As you'll see in this series, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, what I call cross-pollination or the inter uh, usage of airliners and military transports. Uh, it's often written that there were 10,000 DC-3s built, and that's not true. There were 900 plus airliner DC-3s, and the remaining 9,000 plus were C-47 Skytrains, as you see here, used in World War II. Sometimes in aviation history, there's a phrase, too much too soon. And uh, this is not a constellation. It's a triple tail Douglas DC-4E, E for experimental. Uh, it was a, uh, again, a proof of concept prototype. Only one was built, uh, first flew in 1938. Uh, the problem is that it was essentially a four engine DC-3. And uh, it just wasn't an efficient, um, you know, um, four engine passenger carrying airplane. It just uh, didn't really uh, cut it. Uh, the airplane that did and flew that same year uh, was the Boeing 307. And the 307 was a pressurized aircraft that uh, used the wing and engines of the uh, B-17 bomber uh, to create uh, really the first modern, uh, you know, could fly somewhat above the weather, 20,000 foot to altitude, uh, fast, reliable uh, four engine airliner. Uh, in a twist on that uh, process, a bomber was converted back to an airliner with the DC-5. This was a unique airplane. There were only 12 of them built. Uh, they came out of El Segundo, but it used the um, airframe essentially of a DB-7 bomber modified with a passenger fuselage uh, that carried 10 passengers. DC-5 was also used by the military, could carry up to 22 troops. Uh, Coast Guard and Navy used them and it was flown by KLM, which gave KLM the distinction of flying every Douglas production airliner ever built. This particular airplane, uh, one of the early DC-5s, has an unusual history. It was bought as a, uh, an executive transport, uh, kind of the Learjet of its era. Uh, it was owned by uh, the CEO of a large uh, company up in Seattle, Washington, who happened to be a very good friend of uh, Donald Douglas, and his name was William Boeing. By the war years in uh, World War II, there was a need for a four-engine uh, military transport, and the C-54 Skymaster uh, fit that bill. Uh, as you see here, it was a very uh, modern, sleek, efficient, fast airplane. It was not pressurized, but this uh, really uh, became a pivotal part of the military airlift concept in the, uh, throughout uh, World War II, and it gained tremendous fame in the Berlin airlift in 1948, uh, flying supplies into that uh, sequestered city. Uh, and really, again, uh, uh, carried the mission and uh, made Douglas a household name. But as we've seen, the uh, relationship between the military transport and the commercial airliner reversed course once again, and the C-54 Skymaster became the DC-4 airliner. We'll talk about the DC-4 and the other prop airplanes that uh, followed in a future episode. Watch this channel. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed this part of the series. Special thanks to uh, some great folks who uh, made this uh, possible with uh, imagery and input. And thank you very much for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. Until next time, take care.